Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. We chose the name Peak Moment because our world is at a peak moment in energy use, in population, in all kinds of things. My guest today calls this a defining moment in history. He's a big picture thinker, David Corton, who's the president of the board of Positive Futures Network, which publishes, yes, a magazine of Positive Futures. Thank you for joining me today. It's Tell my us pleasure. about a defining moment. Well, many of us have known for a long time that we were headed for a confrontation with the limits of the planet. It's no longer a future moment. It's here. Now. Now. It actually becomes a moment of great opportunity. As my own work has led me to an understanding that actually for the last 5,000 years of human experience, we have been organizing ourselves in a dominator model in our relationships, everything from the relationships among states mm -hmm. to relationships among individuals and family members. So you have a dominant and a submissive, yeah. subordinate, always, everything. Exactly. In and what this means is that we've lived under a system in which the creative energy of the majority of people is systematically suppressed, mm -hmm. preventing their achieving their fullness of their human possibility. Now, we're finally coming up against the limits of an exploitative system, and we are in a position where we are forced to change. So that exploitation is not only of all the peoples, but you're talking about exploiting all the resources on the, so many of the yeah. resources on the planet. The planet is saying, Exactly. I'm running out. And it's amazing, you know, it's all so straightforward once you begin to get into it that if you're going to organize societies on a dominator system, you ultimately end up expropriating most of the resources, the capacities of the society to maintain the system of domination. You know, that's what our military is about, sure, or okay. most of our police okay. forces. Um, Maintaining also, that power structure. Yeah, and including the, the palaces and temples that are the symbols of authority that uh, you know, intimidate us and make us feel small relative to the system, <laughs> powerless. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> Who, uh, just little nobodies, right? Yeah, and then the, you know, the rulers need to compensate their retainers to maintain loyalty and so forth. And you begin to see you know, just how much of society's resources become diverted away from meeting needs of people, meeting needs of nature, to simply supporting a system that by its nature is very self-destructive. So what we have is an alternative. What do we, where do we go from here? Well, it's time to learn to live in cooperative relationship with one another and with the planet. Well, there's partly, an, you, you mentioned an imperative. I mean, part the, the time is here. Yeah. And um, you speak about a, there's a perfect economic storm, I and mean, there's something pushing our backs to mm -hmm. kind of force us this direction, or hopefully move this direction. Well, what, yeah, um, what's happening in terms of the perfect economic storm, it's a, it's a convergence of the consequences mm. of, of peak oil, which is one of your defining topics, uh, climate change, yes. <clears throat> which is Huge. greatly increasing Huge. the severity of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the frequency of severe weather events all around the planet. And then, in terms of our own national situation in the United States, um, you know, the, we're, we're seeing a growing gap between the amount of goods that we import from the rest of the world and what we export. Now, that gap is basically a measure of the uh, extent of our accelerating uh, growth and our consumption beyond mm -hmm. our own means. Mm -hmm. And we're essentially living on credit supplied by the consumer credit, credit card credit from the rest of the world, and with no particular capacity to pay it back, um, which means that eventually the rest of the world's going to get a little tired of supporting us economic deadbeats, and the, <clears throat> the dollar will, uh, will crash. I mean, it's already been in decline for, for some years. But uh, now all of these forces coming together, you know, we've, we've created this corporate dominated, corporate-led, global economy. And, and that actually taps back. We've got two books that we're, I didn't even mention that we're mm -hmm. talking about. Your earlier book, When Corporations Ruled the World, um, you really dove into the negative effects of yes. corporate world. Tell us about that. Yeah. 
Well, <clears throat> actually, it's kind of a long story, and the you know the lead up to that that uh, uh, you know most of my adult life, my wife and I lived in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and we were part of the you know the international development establishment, um, trying to end poverty in the rest of the world by uh, stimulating economies and economic growth, and. Um, <clears throat> After about 30 years of working in that field, both working from domestically and overseas, uh, began to see that the patterns of what was, you know, what was happening were quite at odds with what we hoped would happen, in the sense that more and more people were getting excluded, you were getting a, you know, a few very rich people, but um, most people were being forced into lives of greater desperation. Uh, we're seeing the collapsing of forest systems and uh, uh, coral reef systems and uh, the you know, pollution of rivers and air and so forth all around the world, but also seeing the breakdown of, uh, of, the, of the social fabric of, of many once vibrant cultures. And <clears throat> started getting increasingly concerned about, you know, why is this happening? It's this disconnect, really. Yeah. And then, you know, became really disturbed when began to realize that, you know, it wasn't just in the places where we were working. It was every place, including in the United States and Europe and Japan and the, the countries that we had considered to be sort of models of the uh, positive outcomes of development. And the models the rest of the world <coughs> thought they wanted to go towards. Yeah, exactly. And we were, were telling, you know, yes. you know be, be like more us. like us. Exactly. Right. So... Um, you know, the more I got into trying to understand that, you know, at a deep level, it's about pursuing a development model that is, that is grounded in financial values, in which every decision is evaluated based on financial return, rather than returns to life or to, to living systems. So what would those, those, okay, the values of the economic system said, mm -hmm. economic return, yeah. the wealthy get wealthier... Exactly. System. See, that's a key thing. If you're if you're talking about returns to money, and that's the way the decisions are made, it really means returns to people who have money, which means the people who are already rich. Where it really began to come together is when we realized the extent to which, you know, the number of development projects, like, uh, you know, a, a forestry project or a dam project, or you'd have uh, golf course projects or shopping centers or whatever, or seaside resorts. In pretty much every case, you're ending up pushing poor people off of the land from which they produce okay. their subsistence. Okay. You know, not making any money, they're just growing their food. <laughs> Right, so yeah. they're not in the money system, but they're staying alive and, yeah. and building in the non So they're not contributing economy. anything to the economy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so see, we need to use uh -huh. those resources uh -huh. for things that will contribute to the economy, which means they'll generate money, which means they'll generate so returns the land on the money, so yeah. Okay. So you end up with a few people have control of more and more of the real resources uh, and making more and more money, which is the... You know, which the, is the primary the token, value of the primary value. that system. Yeah, and then you have more and more people... Into, into desperation with no means of supporting themselves. And that, of course, then floods the economy with, with cheap labor, people desperate to work at whatever wage is available. So that, <clears throat> you know, that supports our sweatshops and you know, pushes people into being migrant agricultural workers and so forth, working for whatever pittance is available. And one of your points that you've made <clears throat> is that that really, that wealth, the, system, the dominator system has been based on slavery in one form or the other, and that's basically what we still have here. Yeah, well, see, this is, this is the other part of the story. When, you know, I began to put this together and came to realize that, you know, what we were, what we're seeing around the world was an outcome of a system that, that values that way. But then coming to understand, you know, the institutional structure and how the, uh, you know, how the major economic decisions are made by global financial markets and how that works. Mm -hmm. And then the, the global corporations that are, in a sense, extensions of those financial markets and responding to their demand to generate ever-increasing profits, financial profits. Um, you know, as you begin to see it, essentially by expropriating or consuming life, living resources, mm -hmm. the lives of people, the lives of community, in order to make money for people who are already among the richest on the planet. And probably <clears throat> not living in that community, living in a far yeah. distant place, and not seeing the effects, not seeing the rivers being 
you know, muddied and, and... This is absolutely key. It's a system, an extreme system of absentee ownership. Wow. So, you know, all the decisions are being made are in the name of a set of owners who have no idea what they own, have no idea what the decisions are that are being made in their name, or the consequences of those decisions. So this is what local economies are about, is, <clears throat> you know, really returning that thing on its head so that the people who own the local resources, the people who depend on those resources for their livelihood and who live there and live with the consequences of how those resources are used. <laughs> so that fits your, you know, the title of your new book, The Great Turning. Yeah. From Empire, Empire to Earth Community. To Earth Community. Well, that, that goes, that that goes another, names. see, that goes another step in terms of the story because, um, you know, as I came back, wrote When Corporations Rule the World and wrote that, uh, you know, we, my wife and I moved back from Manila to New York City, heart of Manhattan in 1992. Uh, and that's where I wrote Cor When Corporations Rule the World. We were living next to Union Square between Madison Avenue and Wall Street. So it was very inspiring. Uh, <laughs> <setting>. <laughs> you were in the right place. <laughs> in the right place. And the book came out in 1995, and it was just at a moment when people were beginning to get a sense of there's something wrong going on here. You know, all this corporate outsourcing of, uh, of jobs and the CEOs are getting these astronomical yes. compensation packages, and it seems to be getting harder to get a decent job. And, so, and far less security in those jobs. We watched exactly. that happen at Xerox. It's like what yeah. used to be a security was no more. Yeah, no more. Competition yeah, it's all to just survive. Not about the people or mm -hmm. the community, mm -hmm. the families. It's just about the profits of the corporation yeah. Yeah. and responding to the demands of these impersonal financial markets. So the, 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 the book struck a chord. It helped people mm -hmm. see at that moment what was happening and uh, got quite a major acceptance. Now, also, that was, uh, that was kind of the beginning of, of a, a growing global awareness of what was going on, what these trade agreements are really about yes, and so forth, yes. and um, was part of the birthing of this whole global movement that we call global civil society that was mm -hmm. developing the resistance against uh, corporate globalization. Mm -hmm. Now, In September 11, 2001, we had the terrorist attack in New York City, and we had a new administration that responded in terms of, you know, we need to impose our order on the rest of the world, our will, secure U.S. interests with massive, overwhelming military. U.S. military power. Right. And you had the, uh, you know, you had key people in the administration uh, put out documents about a Pax Americana, with the parallel, I mean, a very explicit connection to the Pax Romana of the Roman Empire. And you had pundits talking explicitly about empire. Now, empire had become sort of an archaic term. We didn't. We've been talking, but in the last couple of years, of the American Empire. You know, yeah. It's become well, it came, common parlance. It came, came into the conversation mm -hmm. from an archaic term that was, you know, we just all sort of assumed that's all yeah. behind Back us. There, yeah, yes. that's, yeah, yeah. Those, those people of old times <coughs> and right, so forth. Right. So... You know, some of us began trying to sort this out. You know, here, um, here we built this analysis around the economic institutions and the economic domination, uh, but it doesn't incorporate the, the military dimension of it or just the raw, naked use of power. So as soon as you start actually talking about empire, you know, that throws the analysis back 5,000 years. And it, uh, you know, as that discussion began to come up, it triggered in my mind conversations I'd had with Rianne Eisler, the, you know, her... Mm classic book, The Chalice and the Blade, and her framing about how in the earlier human, many of the earlier human societies, they tend to be more egalitarian, they were more gender balanced, women in, uh, in leadership roles, and then you had this kind of transition where certain male-dominated tribes began to overwhelm the more, uh, the agrarian societies mm -hmm. and the more egalitarian societies, and began to establish a, a rule by domination, sword and spear and, and bow. Um, and of course, out of that, you began the subjugation of women and you began to move into an era in which increasingly the economies were built on a foundation of slavery. Um, you, <clears throat> now, as you begin to look at that as a, as a pattern of, of organizing, you recognize that there are a number of inherent characteristics of that dominator system. 
it basically pits every human being in competition with every other human yes, being for the yes. few positions at the top. Uh, it becomes very convenient if uh, you can sort of classify whole groups of people as sort of less than human. Sure, uh, sure. Or, you know, the the very other, explicit you know, which These, we continue to do. Yeah, they don't have a real soul. They're not... Uh, They're not know, fully human. Not fully human. Right. And, of course, that label is applied to women and generally to people of color. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, ultimately anybody that was of a lower class. Right. So uh, you kind of have this characteristic pattern of, you know, white male property owners... Uh, generally coming out on top and, and with a, you know, with a great incentive to, to keep, keep it that way, keep it that way through the cultural stories sure. and so sure. forth. So um, <clears throat> then you also, you know, it, it, it creates a play or die dynamic. You, you can't just sort of decide, well, I'm just not going to play that game. <clears throat> because if you're not in there competing, then that means you're, you're cast off into the, into the bottom. And so it, you know, it begins to develop a rule or be ruled, kill or be killed kind of ethic. And, you know, if you're not, you know, if your city state is not ruling your neighboring city state, then they're likely to end up ruling you. Which is what we've watched. Yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to turn us to the turn. I mean, to turn okay. us towards that, that description of empire. Yeah. Towards earth community. I mean, is it even feasible to think about a different set of values? And what would they mm -hmm. be? Well, they would be values of cooperation, values of community. Now, see, part of the way, part of the way empire holds us captive is through controlling stories by which we define ourselves mm -hmm. and our possibilities. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, one of the stories is that whole classes of people are inferior, so they're tuned out. Now, you know, that puts them in a subjugated position in which they're not able to express their full creativity and humanity and so forth. That's just stripped away from society. Uh, you've got all these resources of society being used to maintain the system of domination. Now, part of the story, one of the stories, of course, is that by nature we humans are competitive, uh, violent, greedy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that the only way to keep us under control, uh, maintain order, is through a dominator system with strong armies and police and so forth. Because otherwise we would fight each other ourselves yeah, and, right. you know, we're... Okay. You know, ruled by this sort of elite class, which are the you know the more cultured, educated, and so forth. And they're military. And they're and they're military. Yeah, <clears throat> right. So a key is changing our stories. Now, one of the things that you know, one of the centerpieces of, of my book is looking looking into the psychological literature on development psychology. But what do we actually know about our human nature? Hmm. And what you find is that from our birth to elderhood, there is a steady pr progression if we're in a situation of sufficiently supportive relationships so that we, in a sense, our consciousness can grow and blossom. You know, we come into the world with a very undifferentiated view of the world and everything's sort of defined in terms of my, my comfort or discomfort. Mm -hmm and very little ability to just differentiate between self and other, but it's just sort of, everything is self-referential, mm -hmm. and very little differentiation of being able to see the nuances of what's happening. Uh, now, over time, we develop a more differentiated consciousness, a deeper understanding of how things work, and eventually come, if we develop in a healthy way, to recognize that our well-being depends on the larger well-being of the group, of uh, the community. Everyone. Everyone. Okay. And we move into a, <clears throat> a kind of intermediate stage into what we call a socialized consciousness, which means we begin to accept, absorb the values of whatever the prevailing culture is in which we live. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the foundation of maintaining basic order. That's more or less the kind of modal... Uh, adult consciousness. It's a healthy, basic frame of good citizenship. But it also is very susceptible to manipulation by demagogues and advertisers. You know, that's what political demagoguery or advertising yeah. is about, yeah. to get control of the cultural symbols so you define 
the values by which people just sort of define themselves, you know, brand identity kind of thing. Uh, or if, you know, if a political demagogue, the, the culture of sure. fear and distrust, sure. and so you need me as, you need a strong protector. Good father and, protector here to yeah. take care of you. And, 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 and we need to spend more on the military to, to maintain order and so forth. Um, now, uh, you know, so again, th again for 5,000 years, the, the rulers have been very adept at controlling all those stories. And, you know, what we've seen here in the United States is that you know, we had this extraordinary experience after, uh, after World War II of emerging with a relatively more egalitarian society mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. the built the strong middle class. And yes. you know, most of us grew up at a time when we just sort of took our democracy for granted. It yes. seemed to, it seemed to work. We were doing very well. well. Yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, we were the envy of the world. So hey, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> this, is, this is it. Yeah. Now, Somewhere around in the mid '70s and '80s, you had you had a group of people with a different kind of vision, um, a vision that you know this was kind of you know ordinary people were getting too much power, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the, mm -hmm. the the position of the elite classes was was threatened. Um, that we were you know becoming too um, in certain religious groups that we were becoming too hedonistic there was not yeah. not yielding enough to the to the religious establishment and you you got an alliance of what I call por corporate plutocrats people who believe in rule by the rich and religious theocrats who mm -hmm. believe in a theocratic state um, essentially enforce the you know state enforcing a certain set of religious beliefs and norms uh, and they set about to fund think tanks, media, and so forth, to begin to redo the stories in ways that uh, would strengthen, essentially, uh, elitist control. It's, which is where we find ourselves. It's, which is where we find exactly ourselves. Exactly where I find ourselves. Yeah. And so they, you know, they managed to take control over a major part of the political system, including I mean, kind of wholesale the Republican Party, but as mm -hmm. well, much mm -hmm. of the Democratic Party. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it seems to be pervasive in all yeah, the ways. Yeah, pervasive everywhere. We have mm -hmm. about four minutes, and mm -hmm. I want I want to move towards the story. Yeah. W to turn to turn that story around. Right. And is it emerging? Okay. The the key to understanding our potential is to understand the higher orders of consciousness. If we can break out of the socialized consciousness ah. to the higher orders, which I call the, the next stage is the cultural consciousness, which we're seeing an awakening of a consciousness of culture that comes through increasing uh, cross-cultural exchange. I mean, like in my own case, I, you know, I grew up oh, totally isolated, yes. but I ended up with a life in which I was living among the rich diversity of world cultures. And so I became conscious that, hey, culture's not a given. It's a, it's a construct. It's a variable. And what that meant, and, you know, as you see many different cultures, you begin to realize different values have different consequences. Yes. And some are good and some are bad. And, and uh, you know, and every culture has got some, some advantages. But yes. uh, in the end, we are responsible for our own values. And culture being a variable is subject to choice. This is where the term cultural creatives comes in because mm. you know it requires this cultural consciousness and we can get creative about creating cultures that actually support the realization of the highest, uh, the highest expressions mm. of our human possibility. So this is the first breakthrough. The, the, the ultimate stage of human consciousness is the spiritual consciousness where we come back to a recognition of the, of the unity of all being, but with a highly differentiated sense of the, you know, the wondrous complexity of all of, the, all of reality and the living systems and the, uh, the material and non-material, the spiritual, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the sense of the continued unfolding of creation and of the human place within that unfolding. So then we begin to ask much deeper questions about what does it mean to be human and what is our place of service to the whole of creation as the human species. So this is, a, and this kind of awakening is spreading throughout the world, partly because of the increased cultural exchange and communication, but also because we're seeing 
we're seeing in so many ways the interdependence of living systems and the interdependence of people. So we begin to experience that unity and the importance of each of us accepting a larger responsibility for the whole. And the picture of the planet that we got to see in the 70s is that, that wholeness. Yes. Um, we're also seeing it's a smaller planet just because mm -hmm. of the weather uh, yeah. effects and, and so on. It's, you're starting exactly. to see it's finite. Exactly. That was a defining moment. This, that, mm -hmm. picture, that iconic mm -hmm. picture from space to see ourselves in a whole new way. And it helps us begin to think of, wow, you know, we're living together on a living spaceship. Mm. Now, you know, that's fundamental to a whole new thinking about our economics and relationships. I mean, if you think about living on a spaceship, it's kind of a microcosm, but, you know, you don't waste anything. <laughs> Everything has to be recycled, and your total well-being depends on that. You, you can't live on a spaceship with a few people being in a dominant position and other people being totally excluded. I mean, you'll... He's not you, going to survive. You're not going to That's survive. Right. You That's will. Right. You will destroy the. You will destroy the the systems of the planet and the co competitive struggle. And in the process, you will expire. <clears throat> we have um, that vision. I mean, it feels to me like that's that takes hundreds of years to make that, and yet we don't probably have hundreds of years in terms of the planet's no. resources to do that. We have to change to the like story, this. like that. Change the story. Change the story. That is the key to the whole thing. Change our stories. I mean, partly it's, it's decoding, it's exposing the old stories for what they are. They're propaganda. They're, they're falsified constructions the to keep us... Yeah, bring out the new stories. The one, the one... Of possibility, of community, the interdependence of being, interdependence of life. And, Thank you. And the fact that, that you know, it is our nature ultimately to choose. May we choose that life, that choice. Thank you for this sharing. This has been wonderful. Thank you. This is Peak Moment, and I'm Janaea Donaldson. Join us for another episode of Peak Moment, Community Responses to a Changing Energy Future.